Greetings and pleasant nights, fellow travelers along the path of the beam. I am known on this level of the tower as Jaime and Fuego, and if it please you, join me for some palaver here on Hail to Stephen King. That's right, the twice weekly show that I do here on the Horror Show. Bevanitos, welcome. Thank you so very much for joining me in the continuing coverage of a new limited series that I am doing specifically for this program entitled The Films that failed to remember the face of their fathers. Yes, that's right, and by their father, we mean Stephen King. That's right, my favorite author. And uh, yeah, I've read all of his books as of last September when I finished Sleeping Beauties. And so, yeah, as we await The Outsider to come out, now I'm just, uh, just looking for different ways to explore stuff related to him and, um, you know, works and things of that nature. And so, everybody knows that, uh, there's a lot of these direct-to-video and uh, just crappy knockoff sequels that we got, especially in the 90s with Stephen King. So he established himself in the late 70s and the 80s, and you know, by the time the 90s came around, Stevie K was basically, well, the king of horror, living up to his name, El Rey, as I like to call him. But uh, yeah, so um, we already covered A Return to Salem's Lot, which was a Larry Cohen film that Honestly, in the last review that I did for that one, I ended up having a lot more fun with that movie than I remembered. And uh, yeah, once again, this is not going to be a total just tear it to pieces fest because we're talking about Pet Cemetery 2. And uh, Pet Cemetery is celebrating its 35th anniversary from the, the book's initial publication here this year. And, uh, 2018 but uh, so you can look forward to coverage about the book and some more discussion about the film and stuff the original film at some point in time uh, later this year but yeah today we are talking Pet Cemetery 2 which came out three years after the film so the film was 1989 the original Pet Cemetery, and in 1992 we get a pre-ER Anthony Edwards and a post T2, Eddie Furlong, and then we've also got some Clancy Brown thrown in the mix. Yeah, a lot of people knew him from Highlander at this particular point. It was before he did Starship Troopers, and I actually really like that actor. He's, he's pretty badass, but um, they brought Mary Lambert back to direct this, which is the, the interesting thing, and she had done, you know, done the original one and then lots of music videos, but the problem is the fact that um, it's just not a very good film. I mean, it's, there's way worse Stephen King sequels, you know? I mean, the Children of the Corn franchise, The Mangler, and uh, sometimes they come back again and stuff. I'm looking at you guys. But, um, yeah, Pet Cemetery 2, uh, despite some strong performances from a few characters, it's really the script that just, I mean, it's not based on King's source material. And even though it's playing in the same playground, it just doesn't, I don't know, it treats... It treats the subject matter, I think, a little campier than it needs to. But that does not mean that I can't find merit in certain aspects in this film. Once again, similar to A Return to Salem's Lot, I enjoyed this film not thoroughly, but more than I remember. Okay, so here on The Horror Show, we always, when we're talking about film, we like to cover overall impressions, we like to cover story, acting, uh, makeup, effects, music, stuff like that. And so if I'm going to give an overall impression, this was... um. It's okay, but that's the problem. It's just okay, you know. Um, you know, once again, strong performances, but weak script, and it's too it's too silly at times. However, it is gorier than I remember it to be, and that, especially in certain scenes, um, that was uh, that was where I found some some merit in this. So, if we're gonna talk about the story, so basically, Eddie Furlong, once again, fresh off of T2 and being John Connor and all that stuff. Um, He's got a mom who is apparently a famous actress, and uh, in the first few minutes of the film, she dies, you know? And so, as opposed to dividing time between the separated father and uh, mother, he's, you know, living with his dad now, who is a veterinarian, similar to uh, Dr. Creed, Dr. Lewis Creed from the original, from the original source material on film and, you know, novel and whatnot. And so, for whatever reason, they move to Ludlow, and they end up in the same house that the Creed family had. Now, the, the interesting thing to mention here is that when Mary Lambert was originally brought on to direct this, she wanted the story to actually surround Ellie Creed. They wanted it to be about, you know, a now teenage Ellie Creed being the only surviving uh, member of the family and stuff. I would have been much more interested in that. 
didn't happen unfortunately, but uh, yeah, so it's it's basically Eddie Furlong as the 13 year old and his dad moving to Ludlow. Uh, he's got bullies picking on him and stuff, and he ends up becoming friends with the son of the town sheriff, and uh, yeah, they kind of have a uh, slight outcast camaraderie type thing, you know, the, the, the sheriff's uh, stepson actually is, you know, he, he's overweight, and even though he's like running with some of the bullies that are messing with Eddie Furlong's character, um, you can tell he's got more of like a, a sympathetic kind of perspective to, to this new kid who... The, the bullies are messing with him because his mom was famous or something and, you know, she's dead and they're just digging into him and giving him so much shite. It's really, it's really pretty terrible and, uh, this is where there are so many early 90s tropey things going on in this 1992 film. Like, the kid, he's got, like, the single earring and, like, you know, the, the pierced up ears and whatnot. And, you know, he's a bully, but he's a bully wearing a scarf because it's Maine. I, I don't know. It's, it's silly. But, uh, so... Uh, the stepfather of the, the you know, uh, kid that uh, Eddie's uh, getting, getting to be homies with, he's, uh, he's not the nicest stepfather, he's kind of living up to the, the tropes and stuff that you would think, and so the dog of Eddie's new buddy is, you know, just messing with this, like, <laughs> a bunch of bunnies or something that the sheriff has as, as pets and whatnot, and uh, yet his dog is, uh, you know, like, messing with these rabbits, and so dog gets shot by the, like, kind of asshole sheriff uh, stepfather, and what do they do? They go and they try to see if the, the legends and, you know, all of these stories about their being this, this Micmac, you know, I don't even know if they say Micmac at any point in time in this film, now that I think about it, the Indian burial ground, which by this point is a stereotype in and of itself, because Stephen King said it as such, and uh, yeah, dog comes back. And, uh, you know, sometimes dead is better. Yeah, this dog is definitely messed up when it returns, and they bring it to uh, Eddie Furlong's father, you know, the, the ER dude that I mentioned, and he's like, wow, this dog doesn't have a heartbeat. He must be so weak from being wounded that, you know, it's just not picking up in, in the register. So, as you can probably imagine, yeah, other, uh, uh, like, people end up being, being buried in there, and, uh, uh, as the story progresses, and that's once again the thing that I just had the biggest problem with this. Maybe, maybe some people thought the original Pet Cemetery took itself too seriously, but that's why I liked it so much, you know? This one, um, yeah, it really ups that, that cheese, man, that camp factor, like we were talking about, especially the character who ends up being just the main dead person brought back to life, because I'm not trying to spoil anything for you guys here. Um, it's just too, it's too goofy. Yeah, and honestly, also, far more coherent than they should be. And I know Creed, at the end of the original film, was like, no, 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 maybe I'd let them be dead too long, and if I, you know, bury them in the in, in the burial grounds, like, you know, sooner, they'll, they'll have more of that just semblance of who they were before, and maybe that's the rules that they're trying to go with here. But I don't know, too, too coherent, too much of the previous personality remaining with, you know, some of these people when they start getting, getting raised. So, um... I don't know, there's some okay kills in it and whatnot, but yeah, as, as a whole, the story, it it rehashes too many things, um, it doesn't treat the source material, in my opinion, with enough reverence, it just goes off on this, you know, this bat shizzle crazy, you know, wackiness, and so, yeah, story, um, you know, the one thing that I will give it credit for is I actually really like the friendship between, uh, you know, John Connor's character and the stepson of this sheriff, and the, those are actually some of the bits that work the best, you know? The, the ER dude, his story is boring, and, you know, there's not really much meat to chew on here, if you could say that, but, um, yeah, the stuff with, uh, the stuff with John Connor is pretty, pretty solid, and, you know, the acting is good, and that's where we'll shift into the acting, um, all the performances, including Clancy Brown especially, you know, uh, what they gave him to work with is obviously just it's wax status, but that's the way that they wrote him, and you can tell that he's having fun. He gives a, for the character that he portrays and what they do with his character, it's good. But, um, yeah, Furlong brings it. I mean, this was when he was, once again, hot off T2, so uh, he's a little too emotional at times, but uh, his friend, you know, that becomes his buddy, and when they go and bury the dog together, he's good. Um, Anthony Edwards, I think, is really the one that's just kind of black in this, and I saw him do quality stuff on, on ER, even though I was more of a Chicago Hope fan, but nonetheless, uh, yeah, this, uh, most of the performances, I will say, are actually pretty, 
pretty solid in this. But once again, it goes back to the problematic aspects of the storytelling here. Uh, if we're gonna go into music, <laughs> man, the music is funny because it is so of the era, you know, early 90s. You've got songs from like Jesus and the Mary Train and got Tracy Lords. They do have another Ramon song on here, which is actually cool. I think they played in the closing credits, if I if I recall correctly. I just got done re-watching re this guy, so. Uh, but yeah, it's very much like the the little score bit, like the, the little movement that they keep coming back to. It sounds like an outtake from like a, a Skid Row record or something. So it's very much of the early 80s where there's still like the, the ghost of hair metal hanging around and stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's a song where it's like, you're on my shit list, and it's like kind of a punk, like light metal type thing. So um, yeah, it's it's of that, uh, you know, what they were trying to do in the late 80s and early 90s with just scores and soundtracks to horror films. You know, it's got kind of that like metal little bit to it. But once again, metal of the more commercial friendly variety, I guess you could say. So uh, yeah, music and... Music and score, it's its just okay, but it's nothing that's really like gonna stick out in your head and stick with you. Um, I have to give the most credit to the practical, to the effects. There's some weird like wound stuff and some melty stuff. And uh, honestly, if you think about the original Pet Cemetery, with the exception of the runner, who was like all mangled and messed up, who Creed tries to save at the beginning and keeps popping up over and over, and then the, the Zelda stuff, which I still think is the scariest chisel in the entire original Pet Cemetery film. Um, it really, I, I guess when Creed's wife comes back at the end, you know, and it's Tasha Yar and like half her face is like all mangled and mucked up and stuff, but there is some, there's some good gore in this movie. I have to give, I have to give that credit, especially in the third act, which is when the film kind of falls apart, in my opinion, a little bit, is in the third act, but, um, you know, not that it was that great in the first two to begin with, but nonetheless, um, yeah, some of the effects in this big confrontation at the very end, uh, they're, they're actually pretty damn good, I have to say. There's one thing with the bully, uh, there's another thing with another character that gets risen from the grave after being buried and stuff. So, um, yeah, guys, I don't know. This, uh, once again, I've been trying to make this series, like, you know, the films that forgot the face of their father and all that, but... So far, both uh, the Salem's Lot sequel, which came out in theaters, just like the Pet Cemetery sequel came out in theaters, both of these were not as as terrible as I remember them. However, I understand why Stephen King won his name taken off of this film. You know, it's really got very little, if anything, to do with his source material, with the exception of just you know showing the Pet Cemetery and a very just hodgepodge uh, breeze through of the rules. But you know, there's there's worse horror films out there. It's just, you know, when the, when the original book and film, in my opinion, set such a high benchmark, it's, I mean, what were you going to do if you didn't have any genuine connection with the, you know, with the original characters and, and whatnot, with the exception of just mentioning them here and there. So there you have it, guys. That is my thoughts on Pet Cemetery 2. Um, I say watch it and see what the hell you think. I mean, I've seen, when I was reading some of the uh, vintage reviews and just thoughts on this movie, there was a couple of big publications, uh, one of which being Variety, that thought this was better than the original. Not that they were saying this was a great film or anything like that. I think one of the quotes that made me laugh, uh, they said, they said Pet Cemetery 2 is uh, better than its, uh, its predecessor, but even being better than its predecessor doesn't mean that it's a good movie. So, I don't know. I, uh... I tried to go in with an objective viewpoint, and while I can't say I loved it or anything like that, uh, nor that I would go out and buy it, <laughs> it's it's worth seeing though, you know, especially for Furlong's performance and for some of the cool practical, uh, and Clancy Brown's performance is something else, but ER dude, forgettable, pretty much everything else, yeah. Forgettable. So, I have been Jaime and Fuego. Once again, you can find this show every terrifying Tuesday and every scarific Saturday here on The Horror Show. You can uh, link up with me on social medias like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just at Jaime and Fuego, like you see it spelled below. If you haven't subscribed here to The Horror Show, please do. If you enjoyed this video, please do that like and that share thing with the hashtag 
Hail to Stephen King. And uh, yeah, ring, ring our bell uh, so that you get notifications about any time new episodes of this program, Hail to Stephen King, or other stuff that we do here on The Horror Show, like trailer reactions, film reviews, convention coverage, video game let's plays. Yeah, we consider ourselves uh, very modestly to be the most prolific horror channel on the entire interwebs. We do two to three episodes a day. Yeah, every single day of the week. So I extend a grande gracias once more to all of you constant viewers who have tuned into this. And until the wheel of Ka comes around once more, hasta luego, and amigos and constant readers. And I hope that we get to hang out once again sooner rather than later. And until then, remember, stay scared. And read Stephen King, for God's sake. Please read Pet Cemetery. Hey, ho, let's go.